I am here to share on God's abundant grace, and that is the theme of our At 30 celebration. And uh, I'm grateful that uh, when the Ebenezer had their study, the preacher really shared from Psalm 115, and therefore I will not be uh, sharing from the same. I will actually be using the lectionary readings that were done to us, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 and John chapter 6. And I will uh, narrow down that theme to love of a father. So the reading that came to us from the Old Testament is a story of David when his son Absalom uh, chose to dethrone him. It was an attempt uh, dethronement uh, against his father, a very ugly situation. And that leads me to think of love of a father and uh, thinking in line with what is in the heart of a father. David, when he was running away from his son, I'm sure he didn't run away because he feared the son. He didn't want a confrontation that uh, would turn deadly. Uh, seems like uh, this is an experience. I don't know. I don't know really whether the Gen Z's wanted to dethrone <laughs> Zakayo. <laughs> but it's so interesting that the story looks alike. The stories look alike. And David, he sent, obviously he sent his army against his son's troops. But he had a great love for his love, for his son, that he ordered that the troops save his son. And in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5, these are the words, be gentle with my son Absalom for my name's sake. Praise the Lord. Love of a father. Obviously, uh, I don't want to equate uh, this son with Gen Z so that I'm not, a, I'm not a re on a receiving end, but this was a naughty son, an estranged son. He wanted to dethrone his father. I know the Gen Z's have actually been out there for a better cause. But this young man was naughty and stretched. I don't know whether you've read the story well. He talks of this young man. He was very handsome and likable. And the Bible says that he would stand by the gates and any, anyone who came to see the father, he would tell him, oh, the old, the old man is tired. The old man cannot even handle your issues. Let me hear what you have. And he would listen. I think he had also some wisdom of a kind. And he would sort out issues for people. And people loved him. People liked him. And that way, he was able to draw the hearts of many people to himself. So, uh, when David realized this, he told his troops. He gave them orders concerning how to handle Absalom. And they said, be gentle to him. Praise the Lord. What a father. What a father. Be gentle to, to him. Maybe this is what probably we may have required from our president to tell his troops, be gentle to our young people in the streets. So Joab the, uh, was the lead commander, was the lead commander. 
he did not heed what David told him. And this tells me something. No one has a heart of the father than a father himself. A loving heart and a caring heart. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know whether our president especially, because I'm actually finding it very, uh, quite similar. I don't know whether he had a heart for our young people, but it's really clear that the troops out there, they didn't have it. And that's the same, same experience with Joab. He didn't have a heart for Absalom. A caring father can never harm a son. No matter how uh, estranged or wild a son becomes, this son was that wild. This son went out to the forest, to the wounds. Of course, he was going there so that he can take leadership from his father. But what he didn't know, away from his father, he was very, very much unsafe. Fathers, I do not know how your sons are like right now. They could be out there trying maybe to do things you never taught them. In other words, that is dethroning you. And you could be there worried and wondering, what, man, uh, what manner of a son have I raised or a daughter? I want to tell you, fathers, you owe them nothing but love. Praise the Lord. You owe those children nothing but what? Their wild behaviors are really nothing but a shrouding or veiling of the enemy over their faces. When the enemy puts a cover on a child's face, they no longer see your love. But you still owe them that love. Hallelujah. David had a great love for his estranged son. He wanted to show this love to him by saving him. He wanted to show this love. But the son was not aware that even as the father ran away, he was running to strategize and retreat to save his sons. His son, sons and daughters who are here, maybe you may need to rethink something. If your parents are caring, and I believe they are, they have best interest of you at heart. Do I have young people here? They have best interest of you at heart. The challenge is, at times we get so veiled by circumstances that we think that we have to take something by force. But before we do that, we can check on the levels of love. Now, love to an errant person can only be actualized by grace. And this is a point which we are talking about God's abundant grace. Why? Because grace brings presence of love right in the eyes of that errant person. It is grace that comes for physical experience so that whoever is running away, whoever is fighting back can experience that love. Imagine this is what God did for us. God loved us so much. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 is the one that draws the prayer that you love so much. And the grace and the love and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and for, forevermore. Now, love of a father. Love of a father. The, and the, you know, that is what that, that, that word talks about. The love of a father. When that love becomes so much and the one given love is still errant and wild. The father does not stop. The father goes to the next step. And the next step is to offer grace. Hallelujah. I know fathers, we give up so fast. 
and mothers take over. But fathers listen. It is not natural of us to give up because the original father who is in heaven never gives up. Praise the Lord. He has love that grows into grace. And let me show you how that love grows into grace. It, or rather grew into grace. When God's love was so abundant and we were so sinful and errant and wild against him, he sent his son Jesus Christ. So that physically he can be present with us. And God's presence with us can actually speak deep into our hearts of how much God loves us. Men, we can go an extra mile to show love to our sons and daughters. Praise be to God. Grace of God reaches out. Grace pleads on our behalf. Grace, grace of God endeavors to separate us from the wrath that comes with sin. Now, I, I, I thought through who fights the battle? Who really fights the battle of a father and a son? Who really does it? This was David's dilemma. And I'm sure some of you, you have won many battles. But when it comes to a battle between you and your children, you actually become very weak. True or false? And the young people who are in this congregation, I want to ask you by the masses of God, ensure you're not in battles with your parents. Because your parents are very strong until when you engage them into a battle of rebellion. They weaken. They get very weak. And when they, they don't get very weak because they are weak, they get very weak because of the love they have for you. When love is so much on a parent, they get weak. They can give their all. Isn't this what God did? For so much he loved the world that he gave? Imagine. He gave his son even to the death on the cross. Your parents, your children, and the youth who are here, they can die because of you. Many parents have died and buried because of their children, true or false. Young children and youth, there is a point for you to learn today. Let your parents don't have to die for you, true or false. See the love and see it early and embrace it and tell God, I can do something that can glorify you and bring love back to my parents. So we see David Dilemma. He's facing, uh, uh, he's facing his son, uh, or rather, one of it is facing his son head on would mean danger, a great danger, you know? So he can't go to the battlefield. So he has an option. He has an option. I will send my army. They will go there, but I will order them what not to do. Amen. Of course they are going to fight, but I will order them what not to be gentle to my son. So Joab, and I had Dalia said, he's a man charged with his grace. You see the same way God sent his son Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ was sent with a grace. To come, do not harm my children. Are you getting what I'm saying? The grace of God was so much that he's sending his son Jesus Christ to a very rebellious people. They will even be so rebellious to the point of crucifying him. He had the power, but he had an order. Do not harm them. Praise the Lord. I have so much love, you cannot afford to, to harm them. Have you ever thought about how you have su survived through all this time? Have you not been rebellious many times before God? 
How come he has not harmed you? Even as we think about these 30 years, church, how many things maybe can you recall that you never did right? Isn't it? Could there be that moment that probably there was a pastor and that pastor cried because of you and how you, what you did against them? Do you know those things are not good before God? But God did not allow you to do what? To harm you. I have always heard a word to pastors, and they are here. And I say, our work is never to curse. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you, if the congregation fights against me, and I say a word in pain, it can work against you. And I always say, never speak against a Christian. If it is so hard for you, run away. I normally run away and go for prayers. When I come, I come with a lot of grace. Because that is what God has called us for. And parents, that is also you. A pastor is a parent in church. Parents, you cannot afford to curse your children. Are you getting what I'm saying? But let me tell you, if you spoke a word of curse, it will happen. But that's not the will of God. If God has things to settle with the people, he will settle him without you speaking or speaking. Are we together? When we know what grace is, grace is the abundance of love. Then we go to, know, to the one who knows what love is and cry to him and tell God, I'm just about to speak bad words, but I cannot speak them because you never spoke bad words to me. I want to bless my children. Hallelujah. Are we together, people of God? Yes. I have known pastors who have spoken words of curse to the congregation, and people start falling and dying. But that's not God's will, I can tell you. Are we together? God's will is that people be blessed. Amen. The same case, don't celebrate when someone suffers because of the words you said. That is not God's will. God's will is that you may bless them. Speak to those, to the life of your children. Are your children wayward? Tell God, these children can change in the name of God. Hallelujah. And speak life into them. That is what was in the heart of David. But look, the man he is entrusting with grace, unlike Jesus, this Joab, this man comes and immediately he spotted this young man. The Bible says that Absalom, when he was chasing and he was in the woods, then the, the horse jumped and what trapped him was actually the twigs. And then Joab found the young man, you know, by the way, he had very long hair and hanging by the hair, he saw him helpless and trapped. So this young man was at the masses of Joab. Look at that. He was at the masses of who? Joab. And let me tell you something. Do you know that is what sin does to us? You run away from God in sin and you can run as fast as you can. You can see he was running in horse. horse horses are strong, isn't it? But the horse failed him that day. He was caught up in the twigs. Sins can be like horses, but sins fail you at some point. When Jesus comes and fights you, what does he do? He embraces you, isn't it? But Joab did not do that. The Bible says he thrust his three spears, one, two, three, all into the heart of the young man. And immediately, Absalom was helpless. Then the armor bearers came with the sword and chopped off the neck of the son. That was so sad, and especially so sad for David. Who is it? I want to ask you this question. Who is it that you're sending to rescue your son out there? I know it is not all the time that you're able to engage your son because when you engage, just like David, you know there can be altercations that can lead to the worst thing. Who is it that you're sending to your son? 
pray for that process. Amen. David's men became the enemy of his fatherly love to the son. It is not the enemies of our father in heaven who destroy us first. It is those who are close to our father. Joab was so close to David, yet he destroyed David's son. Think about many children who are lost in the hearts of most trusted hearts. Can I start with the hands of pastors? Are there children who have who are gone astray in the hearts of pastors? Yes. Today, without a shame, I can say there are pastors who are into homosexuality, isn't it? So you think your son has a father figure, and they will call them father, but father leading them into destruction, isn't it? Yes, teachers, isn't it? So you think teachers, you think you have a teacher to mentor your child, but they mentor them against you what you want. Counselors, not all of them. Mentors, you have to pray for that process. Because you, miss, you still need someone where you cannot be able to address. You still need someone, but pray for that process. And God will lead you. Let me talk about wasted grace. I see some, something on wasted grace. David mourned Absalom. And this is what this father did. He cried, Oh, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. My son, my son. This is a father crying. Just imagine if Absalom happened to wake up in the presence of a father and found him crying, mourning him. Do you know, Absalom was wishing his father dead, but his father was wishing Absalom alive. What an irony. Imagine this young man woke up. He would have possibly changed immediately. Isn't it? But sadly, all was lost. I want to ask everyone here today, there is so much of God's grace, but it can be wasted on your life. Hallelujah. Be wise enough to know that God has a lot of love for you. He loves you. Amen. Death of a sinner is a big loss to our Father in heaven. We have buried many people, especially young people, who have died because of things that should not be killing them in the first place. Isn't it? All this time you are lost into these things, the love of the Father is upon you. How many of our girls are we possibly going to lose? Even in those apartments. They are thrown down from apartments and suicide is what we are told happened. And it is not true, isn't it? But why were they thrown from apartments in the first place? Because they were moving away from the love of a father and pursuing love that is not love. Isn't it? Same case with the young men. How many of you are we going to lose in drugs? How many of you are going to lose their life? Because you are so intoxicated and you had to drive well, you shouldn't be driving. How many of you are we going to lose? I want to urge you, don't waste the grace of God. Hallelujah. Are we together, young people? Don't waste the grace of God. The Lord loves you so much that he cannot afford to lose you. But sadly, sadly, there is something that separates him, you from him. And that is the veil of a devil. And that is why he's sending Jesus Christ to remove that veil off you so that you can see the love that he has for you. If you don't see it, if you won't see it and you die, that is the end of you. 
Our father may mourn you, but he will never rescue you after death. Are we together? May the Lord help us. What kills a sinner isn't, re isn't really lack of love from the father. It is a veiling of sin just as Absalom was veiled. In the true heart of a father, father is a source, source of life. Isn't it? Hallelujah. So every son here present who can recognize a father, because they are there, honor them, not for anything else. They are sources of, of life. And the young men who are here present, please, that's a very powerful statement. So don't go starting life that you cannot take care of. Hello? Because to originate a life is something very divine. Praise be to God. A father is someone who establishes, he institutes. Father's death in the place, in the place of a son wouldn't really be a death. It would be a replacement. A father would replace himself if he died in the place of a son. And that is why David is saying, I, I wish I died in the place of my, my son. Similarly, God wished himself dead and not us. That is why, you know, the Trinity is a mystery. So you wonder why Jesus, Jesus is God coming as a man, isn't it? So he wishes himself death in your place. There is no way God is going to die and you die. If you die when he has died, son of God, then that will be counted judgment over your life. Are we together? Because father is a source of life. So when father dies in Jesus Christ, he knows because he's a source of life, you take it again. But you are not. He wants to give you life now. So that when you exit earth, you don't go to waste. Hallelujah. I hope someone is grasping some wisdom here. So the only difference between Absalom and Jesus Christ is this. Jesus wasn't veiled with sin when he died. Absalom was. Jesus was coming to save sinners. Absalom was fulfilling his selfish desire. Jesus wasn't a disobedient son. He was obedient. His death was not permanent. Absalom's death was permanent. We can choose Jesus. Hallelujah. He is God's abundant love. The love that has sustained this church for 30 years, that love can sustain you to eternity. Are we together? Didn't you celebrate 30 years? Now those of you who are here 30 years ago, were you aware that you would celebrate? I'm asking you, were you aware that today you will celebrate? You aren't. So I want to remind you something. There will be celebration of eternal life one day. Something beautiful than what we did here today will be happening in heaven. Are you going to be part of them? Are you going to be part of them? Hallelujah. That's a decision that you can make right here. And you choose it because of knowing the one who is full of grace. I finish with a little bit mention of John. John chapter 6 verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Now, time will not allow. I would have asked a video clip to be played. Don't play it, please. But uh, I'm so fond of watching the animal world, and especially when, you know, those carnivores are preying on the, you know, 
the herbivores. I really love those things. And you look at those ka impara, you know, being caught, and all of a sudden being torn. Have you seen that? Now, then I think of what the nutritionists tell us. You are what you eat. So a lion, in a, if you are to describe a lion, you cannot describe a lion without an, a zebra. You cannot describe it without an antelope that it ate. True or false? And you know even you, you eat cows, you eat goats, so you cannot be described without those. Because you are what you eat, true or false? And you know, somehow, in one way or another, God has to kill an animal for you to eat. God has to allow a crop to give yield for you to live. Isn't that a fact? It is. Now, why am I thinking about this? When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, do you know what he means? He means, one day, I came on earth. I grew up. Then I offered myself. Look at, look at this. The sinners were all over me, just like lions and hyenas on an antelope, tearing me with whips, right? That's how the body of Jesus was broken. Do you see when we say, and he broke it? It was broken by whips. It was broken by spears. It was broken by nails. And finally, it was broken in decay. You understand? Now that body was broken so that it can become bread of eternal life. How come you so much trust your bread for this physical life that without that goat, without that chicken, without that bread you cannot, you cannot live, yet you cannot trust that without the body of Jesus there is no eternal life. Is it making sense? I believe in, I believe in us, uh, you know, having a conversation on these things because to me, they are more sensible than anything else. Jesus goes out the cross. The essence of Jesus as a bread is broken at the cross. We share his body that is broken because of love and grace. God's abundant, that he has. Have you broken the bread of Jesus here and celebrated the Eucharist? Have you? Have you? When the minister broke that bread, did you truly appropriate that in your heart? Or did you just do it for the sake of it? Were you so shrouded in your mind like Absalom that you eat of this bread and you don't know what it means to you, that is wasted grace. And I call you today to connect yourself with this true grace. Hallelujah. Of course, animals would be broken out there in the fields unwillingly. But Jesus' body was broken out of love. Jesus' broken body is Father's abundant grace shown to the world to reclaim you, to recreate you, to reestablish you, and to reinstill to you. God's love is more clear than David's love for his son. Isn't it an irony that Absalom wants to dethrone his father, but the father wants to rescue him? How many times do we act as enemies of the father with no idea that when we are acting as enemy of, the fa of our father, he's working hard to save us. We need to rise up to that fact. When sin stands against God, when sin stands us against God, he sees his original plan for us. He works towards averting death, for the wages of sin is surely death. He seeks to rehabilitate us, to, recon to reconcile himself with us, in the new covenant, the Father offers his son Jesus Christ to search for the many lost and sins of those who are shrouded in it. 
That is what we call God's abundant grace. I finish by saying this. He says in John that he is the bread of life. The bread that comes from heaven. Bread is never eaten whole, true or false. It is broken. It is shared. Will you accept a share of who Jesus is this morning? As we celebrate Arima there at 30, may the Lord have mercy on us. In the name of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.